Uh, okay, Santo, you can go ahead. All right. Uh, thank you, Richard, uh, uh, for running this uh, uh, the seminar series and to Matt Lapa as well. And uh, let me start by thanking Mike Hermley and Ashwin uh, Vishwanath, uh, both for inviting me to give this talk and for the fearless leadership of the UQM collaboration. It's been great. It's been wonderful to interact with uh, all the members of this collaboration. Um, um, yeah, so I look forward to uh, uh, both to giving this talk and to hearing comments from this wonderful community. Um, so uh, the work that I'm going to talk about uh, was really led by Dominic Kels, who's been an absolutely wonderful postdoc that I've had the privilege of interacting with and learning from at MIT. Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, they've also, uh, so part of the work involves a collaboration with another wonderful postdoc, uh, Ryan Thongren, uh, who's at Harvard. And uh, uh, some related work, uh, some work related to what I'm going to talk about is uh, something that Ethan Lake, a student of mine has been doing. Uh, I, I will not have time to, have, to actually talk about what Ethan is doing, but uh, 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 it, talking to Ethan has been very helpful in all this. Okay, so uh, a great example of ultra quantum matter is provided, you know, things, uh, uh, an example of a great example that actually exists in experiments of ultra quantum matter is provided by these non fermi liquid uh, metallic ground states. Uh, so in a number of condensed matter systems, metals that violate Fermi liquid theory down to very, very low temperature, uh, much lower than microscopic energy scales exist. Uh, the most prominent example perhaps is this uh, strange metal region in the whole dope cuprates. Uh, other prominent examples are heavy fermion metals near quantum critical points, uh, materials like ethereum, rhodium, silicide, uh, cerium, copper, gold, uh, and so on. Uh, and given the low temperature to which this violation of Fermi liquid theory is seen, it's uh, natural to presume that, uh, that, that the non-Fermi liquid physics is controlled by a zero temperature fixed point that is a non-Fermi liquid, okay? So this is what I'm going to be interested in in this talk. Uh, There's uh, a distinct phenomenon, uh, somewhat of a distinct phenomenon that people sometimes uh, also discussed in this field, which concerns high temperature breakdown of Fermi liquid theory. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, is discussed quite a bit as well, but that's not the focus of this talk. So one of my dreams for ultra quantum matter is that, uh, you know, for this collaboration, is that during the lifetime of this collaboration, perhaps we will actually figure out what's going on in systems like these, right? So understand the strain metal regime in the cuprates, for instance. That would be great if that happens. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so, so the work that I'm going to talk about uh, is based on a few assumptions, three assumptions to be precise, about the class of strain metals. In fact, people who are that some of the older people listening will probably tell me to call these our central dogmas. Um, uh, if you understand where that comes from, then that's a revelation on how old you are. Uh, uh, anyway, so our three assumptions are that the, uh, uh, the essential physics of these strange metals uh, does not involve disorder. That will be the first assumption. The second assumption will be that the conductivity as a the electrical conductivity as a function of frequency and temperature obeys the scaling form. It's one over temperature times some function omega over t, low omega and low t, but the ratio omega over t or arbitrary, with this function having a non-zero value at when its argument is zero. So at zero frequency, the conductivity then goes like one over the temperature. Now that of course is the famous uh, translate into resistivity, it tells you the resistivity is linear in temperature. So that's the famous DC linear resistivity of many strain metals. Hope oh, that certain, the frequency depends follows the scaling form. And the third assumption is that the strain metal is compressible. Okay, so these are the three main assumptions that we're going to make. 
and we'll explore the consequences of these assistants and more as to the talk. But before I go there, I want to spend a few minutes talking about why we make these assumptions. Okay. Uh, so why these assumptions? First, uh, the, the first reason is because they're extremely well motivated by experimental attributes and on human on quantum points. So it's an experiment. Experimentally, these are reasonable statements to be making about the data, uh, as, we, as we'll see. Um, uh, now, there's also a theoretical reason. Uh, uh, these are interesting assumptions to make theoretically, uh, precisely because, as we'll see in this talk, uh, these assumptions are mild assumptions. We're not making detailed assumptions about the system. Just making so that it's clean, that it satisfies scaling, and that it's compressible. But despite being mild, uh, these assumptions constrain the theory uh, very strongly, and hence our expectation of the phenomena that we're interested in. Uh, making these assumptions helps us narrow the range of theories uh, in, in which we conduct our search. That helps us narrow that range down considerably. Okay. So that's question. a good theoretical reason. Yeah. Um, if you violate one of the assumptions but maintain, you know, two of them for different choices of the one you violate, is it easy to satisfy the other two? Uh, it depends on which one you violate. Um, for instance, you can violate the conductivity scaling and a firm lipid will satisfy those two. We'll see how it goes, right? So it's, that question is better discussed after we understand Contains coming from different Okay. Okay. All right. So let's look at the. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about the experimental basis for these assumptions. Right. So the first assumption is that the essential physics does not involve disorder. Okay. So let's see why it's a reasonable statement to make. So I show here. Stain material transport on a variety of cuprate materials. So cuprate refers to the copper-based high TC superconductors. Uh, so this very old uh, on land strontium copper. Right? Here on the doping, where the TC is highest, that's where it's in the vicinity of that. That this linear resistivity is sub, uh, the best seen. And uh, you see the data here, it's linear and uh, uh, down to very low temperature from very high temperature going through room temperature. And um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, so that, that's what it is. Right? It's this kind of behavior. Uh, there's another famous plot on a different cuprate material, a single layer BISCO, as it's called. Uh, again, the resistivity is linear. Uh, down to very low temperature, in this case, about 10 Kelvin, starting from about 800 Kelvin or so. Right? Um, and this yet another cuprate material, thallium, barium, copper oxide, uh, uh, very nice data from Andy McKinsey uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, beautiful temperature. And I want to particularly highlight uh, more recent relative to these uh, ancient papers, uh, uh, more recent uh, paper by Louis Typhus group, I did Lanthanum strontium copper oxide, where you suppress the sibling activity at the magnetic field. So then you can study this linearity down to ultra low temperatures. And down to about 2 Kelvin, the resistivity is completely linear. Okay. Uh, so this is what I meant by saying that the linearity persists to energy scales to temperatures that are very low compared to microscopic scales. Now, uh, there's an interesting feature about this linear resistivity, which is that depending on the sample, if you make a good enough sample, the residual resistivity is almost zero. So on keynote, I just drew a straight line through this data uh, uh, on thallium, barium, copper oxide. And as you can see, the extrapolation of the linear resistivity more or less to zero at zero temperature, right? So the residual resistivity can be made very, very small and is perhaps even absent in the best samples. So this suggests that perhaps disorder is not essential to the basic things, perhaps. But I'll add a bit more, give a bit more evidence for why this statement is reasonable. So fairly recent, uh, 
two years back in this paper, uh, your uh, retired first group, but uh, uh, you know, amongst other things, uh, the authors collected together the slope of the T-linear resistivity in, uh, in four different holdout triplets. It says seven here because the other things include other materials. Um, and uh, uh, compared to materials, what's important to do is to look at what's called the sheet resistivity. It's the resistivity per copper oxygen layer. Uh, and and uh, so that requires dividing the measured slope by the layer separation uh, in, in these two plates. And you see that the slope uh, of sheet resistivity is basically the same for all these different materials. Okay. These materials all have in common copper oxygen, but they are grown in a different way. They, and they certainly will have different uh, strengths of disorder uh, in uh, uh, Look, they'll have very really stress. Despite that, the slope resistivity, okay, uh, which again suggests that uh, perhaps the slope is not that sensitive to disorder, and perhaps disorder, in fact, doesn't play any role in determining this uh, the, 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 this linear resistivity. Okay, now different materials is always a tricky game. You don't know what else you've changed. Um, uh, so, in, so, so it's actually interesting. It's possible to extend so the slope on disorder in a single cuprate material. And it's actually very interesting. They somewhat obscure but ancient, uh, uh, obscure but seemingly reliable paper from Pondre Alul and collaborators, uh, where they took a prominent cuprate material, yttrium barium copper oxide. And you study it with electron irradiation, which is a very gentle way to increase disorder strength, right? And what you see is that linear resistivity, uh, so these different numbers, zero, one, two, three, refers to the amount of exposure time that you have to the radiation, and that's a gentle way to increase disorder. So to increase the disorder, the, the slope of this linear resistivity does not change, but the intercept changes. So the residual resistivity changes, uh, they extrapolated the residual resistivity, but not the slope itself. Hey, so all these kinds of phenomena. Fanto, yeah? sorry, the, the audio uh, is not uh, not good. I think uh, maybe you can turn off your, your video. So, okay, uh, all right, maybe a bit. I'll I'll tell you what. Um, maybe a bit complicated for me to. Um, I mean, I'm not noticing any problems with the audio. Maybe oh, really? <laughs> connection to it okay. <laughs> then maybe it's... Oh, I, uh, I have a lot of issues with the audio. I can still turn off my video. Uh, uh, if there's no problem, yeah, if, if the audio is good for everyone, then you, yeah, you can stay, stay there. Yeah. Stay. Bad for me and a lot of people are saying... Yeah, maybe... Good. Oh, that's for some people. It's fine for me. Oh, I see. Let me see. Wait, that's my button. To off video. Uh, Sento, I turned off your video. Oh, oh very good. Thank you. Uh, I was having difficulty getting that. The usual button has disappeared from my screen. All right, uh, is this better now for most people? Yeah, let's see how it goes. Um, yeah, it's uh, better. <laughs> I see it's bad. It, it's actually a nice feeling for me to be told that the people can't hear me. Um, sorry, uh, is, is this better? Yeah, it's yeah, it seems it seems better. Seems better. But now okay, let me just better. continue with this. Um, let me continue and see if if it stays bad. Then I'll try to switch the audio to my iPad and maybe. This is good. This is good. Yes. Sorry. Okay, let me just continue. And uh, someone should stop me if uh, people can't again. Okay, 
So anyway, so this is a, this is my sense to emphasize that disorder is not critical in understanding the uh, physics of stained metal, and that we can understand uh, the essential physics by building a, la a, a lattice translation invariant model. Okay. So let me now turn to the second assumption that the conductivity satisfies the scaling. Uh, so the DC part of the scaling is something that I already discussed. That's the linear resistivity. So the question is, uh, to what extent is there omega over T scaling in the frequency dependent transport? So there is some evidence for that in the experiments, but the evidence is not super strong. Um, uh, so I show here is, uh, measurements of the real part of the conductivity uh, in the in a cube rate and a layer as a function of M number, you should just think of that as this is frequency. Um, and uh, so actually there's a lot of data in these measurements. Uh, the one thing that everyone notices immediately is this tail at high frequency. I'm actually not going to talk about this tail at all. This tail has a power of dependence but it goes up to, uh, so this scale corresponds to about an electron volt. Uh, so it's probably, my guess is that it's probably not related to any zero temperature quantum criticality, but that's a totally different distance. Instead, uh, the thing to focus on is what happens the, at the low frequency end of this uh, data. And the same authors try to scale the low frequency part of the data versus so uh, uh, as KBT sigma of omega on the uh, y axis versus uh, H bar omega over KBT on the x axis. And that's reasonable scaling, at least out to frequencies of order 1.5 times temperature before it starts going and uh, deviating. And the deviation at high frequency from running into this tail, which presumably has a different origin from uh, what it was giving this near scaling. Now, much more recently, just this year, uh, a few months back, there was data on a heavy fermion quantum critical system, which again uh, gave some evidence of conductivity scaling as a function of omega over t. Again, this is uh, it's great as a first look at the possibility of scaling, but there's a lot more that needs to be done here. Uh, the scaling exponent is not quite what one would expect based on DC transport. But if you restrict to data below five Kelvin, uh, th then you get indeed the right kind of uh, scaling exponents. So this suggests, but it's not completely established experiment. Okay, so the final assumption is the stained metal is compressible. And you know, there's not really doubt any of the literature on this uh, problem, uh, but it's actually very, not very well explored experimentally. Um, uh, one piece of evidence uh, supporting this is that the disputative metal quantum critical point in the cube occurs at different things in different materials. And uh, very recently, uh, two years back, it was shown that at least in one material, you can tune the location of this critical point uh, by pressure. Uh, uh, there's a paper by Louis Taifer's group from two years back that suggests the critical doping is not pinned to any special value. Okay, so anyway, that's the evidence. That's the uh, the experimental reason supporting these uh, assumptions. Uh, now, if if you're if you're the kind of person who whose eyes glaze when looking at experimental data, you can start relaxing now. I won't show any data for the rest of the talk. So, in the rest of the talk, I'll take grant assumptions and ask for Chains that follow on the IR theory. Okay, so the plan for the rest of the is to uh, assumptions one and three. So we think think generally about compressed spaces and systems with lattice translation symmetry. Uh, we'll be thinking about Landau Fermi liquids and Leidenger's theorem, and then we'll think generally about the compressibility, uh, and then. Towards the end of the talk, we combine our understanding of uh, compressible phases in general with the uh, with assumption two on the spinning transport. And it turns out that the very general graph, this leads to a number of statements about tra transport 
in a same method that satisfies these assumptions. And that leads to some very concrete statements for experiments on these terms without that, in fact, theoretical model. Okay, uh, so let's I, start with some preliminaries. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I want to ask uh, something about the assumption one. So previously you mentioned uh, your interpretation is the slope of the linear T is independent of disorder. I wonder if it's reasonable for me to say something even stronger that the slope is just independent of not only disorder, but also the material. It seems to be roughly the same in different materials that I, I showed you the, the table, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so it may well turn out to be the case that it's exactly the same number for all cuprate materials. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so in this talk, I'm trying to assume as little as possible, right? Now, a lot more may be true than what I've assumed, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, let's just go with making as few assumptions as possible. Okay. So I want to make some general remarks on uh, global symmetry in quantum manipulative physics. Uh, usually we'll have UV theory in global symmetry group, GV. And then at low energies, depending on which phase you're in or which fixed point, which critical point you're in, there'll be an IR theory. will in general have a different global symmetry, which we'll call GIR. And there'll be some bit of this group, GAR. And in this talk, I'll be interested in situations where GUV is an ordinary symmetry, a zero form symmetry. And furthermore, uh, where UV is not spontaneously broken, the AR. The principle AR may include all kinds of symmetries, including higher form symmetries. There may be fractionalization. Uh, uh, GUV is just an ordinary symmetry. And that's in current matter, that's the appropriate symmetry. The donor have emerged so G be bigger than G U V. And furthermore, emergence may have anomaly, which will be constrained in some way by the UV theory. Now uh, uh, UQM audiences are uh, this very well. So a uh, tooth anomaly, one way to think about it is that if we couple the system to background uh, to gauge field, gauge the top, then and, and the defined in space time dimensions within a tooth anomaly for this AR, then the gauge variant link to a background gauge field is obtained if we the gauge in one dimension. A topological action uh, in these one dimension that's related to that of an asymmetry protected topological phase. So the correspondence between the tooth anomalies in these space time dimensions and SPT or more generally in vertices in this one dimension. Okay. So for us, the global symmetry that we are going to be interested in is, has an internal U1 symmetry corresponding to charge conservation and lattice translation symmetries on a d dimensional lattice. And toward the talk, I will not specify the Hamiltonian other than to require that it is a local Hamiltonian. Okay. So this includes almost everything that we are typically interested in in Kenneth Spider physics, uh, Hubbard model and its variants. But it doesn't include everything because it doesn't include the SYK models uh, because not as typically do not have lattice translation symmetries. Okay, uh, but I've already made the assumption that I'm going to think about a clean system, so we'll look at translation variant models. So with these symmetries, uh, we can define the lattice filling, which is the average global U1 charge per unit cell. And in a compressible phase, we can tune this lattice filling continuously uh, without uh, changing the, uh, the essential physics. Now, let's let me say a few words about lattice translations and how they are embedded into the IR theory. Now, a unit lattice translation in the UV theory will map to some infinitesimal lattice trans the infinitesimal translation in the IR theory. But more precisely, we should allow for the action by an internal symmetry of the IR theory. A good example that illustrates this is provided by an icing antiferromagnet. So up, down, up, 
the two is a nice thing antiferromagnet to, to its critical point. Uh, for instance, the finite temperature critical point. We know that the IR theory is uh, just continuum five to the four theory for the uh, I think for the parameter. Uh, now we uh, unit lattice translations in the UV embed into the IR continuum five to the theory simply by the transition phi goes to phi because it happens under the lattice translation. So uh, it embeds as an internal symmetry of the IR continuum phi to the four theory. So there may be exceptions to this uh, statement that lattice translations in, uh, in the UV embed as uh, internal symmetry actions of the IR theory. Uh, if there may be exceptions, if the IR does not involve spatial coarse graining. But I'm going to leave this subtlety aside and nothing to worry about at some future point. Uh, and in the vast majority of phases that one thinks about, it will generally be true that we don't need to worry about the subtlety. Now, we already know many examples of constraints from the UV IR in systems with these symmetries. The most well known example is that trivial insulators, that is, things that you can deform to band insulators, need integer filling per, per flavor, per spin, for instance. Uh, uh, we, we all know the Leap Schultz Mattis Soshikawa Hastings theorem that if nu is p over q, uh, ground states that preserve these symmetries must either have topological order or be gapless. And finally, no Ludwig theorem uh, in a Fermi liquid that fixes the volume of the Fermi surface uh, uh, divided by 2 pi to the d to be equal to new mod modulo and integer. And Ludwig's theorem, of course, uh, was proved by Ludwig in the 1960s. And as uh, many people, many of you know, uh, there was a nice non perturbative arg argument by Oshikawa uh, uh, 20 years back. Okay, uh, so let's uh, uh, briefly uh, think about the most famous, well known of a complete phase in a clean system, which is the Lando Fermi liquid. And we'll revisit the Lando Fermi liquid, letting just here set the stage for thinking about more general compressible phases. Okay, let's take lattice liquids and turbulence. So the UV theory of one's lattice z squared. And the IR theory uh, in Fermi liquid theory has quasi-particles near a sharp Fermi surface with the, uh, with the standard liquid Hamilton, where k is the particle number point k of the Fermi surface. Okay. Now, uh, the question we are interested in is on the emergent symmetry of the Fermi liquid. And the colloquial way of uh, understanding is to say that the quasi particles are, are, are conserved for each Fermi surface point. Uh, now, more precisely, what this means is that for each point on the Fermi surface, there's a conserved charge density n theta such that n theta d theta is the number of quasi particles between theta and theta d theta. Here it has any coordinate that labels the uh, the circle that uh, is the, this loop that uh, describes the Fermi surface. Okay, so general IR symmetry element uh, is generated by this n theta d theta. So it's uh, objects of the Fermi d i times integral d theta f of theta and theta for smooth functions f of theta, and these define smooth maps from a circle to the group U1. And these maps form a group, which is known as the loop group that uh, may be familiar to people from 1D, 1 plus 1D conformal field theory. Uh, and this, uh, uh, so we'll call this loop group, uh, this particular loop group LU1. We'll identify this with the GIR in the Fermi liquid. So the next thing we want to understand is how to embed the microscopic symmetries, uh, conservation lab translation uh, into the uh, this low energy the, into the GAR, the total charge is obviously integral d theta and theta. So that's uh, uh, the understand. Now unit lattice translations along say the x or y direction embed as e to the minus i integral d theta kf alpha and theta, where alpha is either x or y, uh, uh, and I've chosen the lattice constants to be one. So uh, so 
So clearly, both U1 and lattice translations of the UV, we've identified what elements of the LU1 IR symmetry they embed into. In fact, we can take the action of lattice translations on the IR theory to define the Fermi momentum in the IR theory. Now, in the Fermi liquid, there's many ways to define the Fermi uh, uh, momentum. And uh, th this is a way that will be convenient for, you know, this is a nice way to define it which generalizes to known Fermi liquids. Now this emergent symmetry of the Fermi liquid has an, has an tooth anomaly and a physical manifestation is that if we turn on an external electromagnetic field, for instance, in an external electric field, the entire Fermi surface gets displaced in the direction of the electric field, which destroys separate conservation of all the n thetas. Uh, only the total charge is conserved. A more entertaining example, a more uh, interesting example is with the uniform external magnetic field then we know that the quasi-particle moves around on the Fermi surface through a V cross B force. And that clearly destroys the separate conservation of each n theta, but only preserves the total conservation of charge. So that's the physics. Now let's study this formally by coupling to background gauge fields. Okay. Uh, so uh, for GAR being this loop group LG1, the gauge field uh, so we have to ask what the gauge field is that couples to this loop group, right? So the gauge field will involve ob objects that cup, you know, A0, AX, AY, and an additional, so these are just the ordinary electromagnetic field, and an additional A theta corresponding to the theta direction. And which in principle, we should take all of these as functions of T, X, Y, and theta. So that's, we have a four dimensional gauge field uh, and that's what it really means to, to have a gauge field that couples to this loop group LG1. Now this A theta component has a nice interpretation as a very connection on the Fermi surface. It tells us how to, how to move in the theta direction along the Fermi surface, okay? So naturally with a four dimensional gauge field, any anomaly will be related to a 5D topological action of a U1 gauge field, okay? So, and the natural guess for the corresponding topological action is 5D churn simons theory written in this form uh, with a coefficient M, which is quantized to be an integer. And the claim is that M equals plus or minus one correctly captures the physics of the Fermi liquid. So it's useful though perhaps though not necessary to have a physical picture for what these extra dimensions are. And uh, we can interpret the fifth dimension as just going into the interior of the Fermi surface, okay? So then we can think of this 5D U1 gauge field as living in two space, one time, and two momentum directions. And then we think of the Fermi surface itself as a boundary of the rigidly occupied Fermi C. So in that sense, these five dimensions correspond to four space, phase space dimensions and one time. And in current spiral physics, there are other instances in which people have found it useful to introduce phase space gauge fields. For instance, this paper by Sholiang, T, and collaborators. Um, so there's a point of view on this uh, on this five dimensional on the on the emergence of this five dimensional topological action. So let's understand the the, the anomaly from this point of view. Uh, let's imagine that we turn on a two pi flux of the electromagnetic field. A X A Y, okay. So when we calculate, when we take this five D churn Simons term and calculate it, evaluate it, and the person has a question. Sure. Yeah. Right. So so if I if I bend the uh, if I bend the uh, Fermi surface to be straight lines, well then uh, then the anomaly is just like a, a just like a collection of a one dimensional. Uh, Latinger liquid or, or one dimensional yeah. form the left and right moving uh, chiral modes. Right. So, so the U1 anomaly, just the chiral U1 anomaly, uh, to anomaly in, in one plus one dimension. So the, so the, how does this uh, five dimensional response theory res, re, respond to uh, uh, the seemingly simpler uh, anomaly in the uh, one plus one dimensional chiral U1 anomaly? Uh, uh, yeah, so that's a very, special case, as you want to imagine in completely straight Fermi surfaces, uh, no, no hopping in the, uh, just a collection of 1D wires or something. 
but essentially, essentially, I think it is it sophistically is the same anomaly, right? Uh, if I if yeah, I so part, that, so the electric field part of so I've talked about the magnetic field. I am in, in the process of talking about the magnetic field. You could ask about the electric field response given by this uh, uh, anomaly, right? Where the entire Fermi surface display, uh, you know, is displaced. Now, if you go to the special case of these straight Fermi Fermi lines. Uh, the 1D anomaly is, is the exact same thing, right? The entire Fermi points in 1D displaced in the direction of the electric field. So that will be captured by this, the same theory, the same, uh, the same story, okay? But for what I'm going to do, it's more interesting to think about the magnetic field, okay? Yeah, okay. Uh Right, so 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 you are saying that if I if I if I really do this uh, uh, do this uh, straight line from a surface, then the, then the five D transmission will will reduce to the ordinary uh, I, yeah. Yeah, or yeah, so the effect of the electric field, the, the fact that the in, in an electric field there's this displacement of the Fermi surface that is captured correctly. So and that is the anomaly in one D. Yeah. Right? Okay. I may ask two questions. <clears throat> One is, uh, how do we understand locality in this five-dimensional space? And second, two of the coordinates are x and y, and two others are kx and ky. Mm -hmm. Do we think of them as commuting or not? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the locality, uh, it's certainly there at the. Uh, that, so the statement is that the anomaly, the, the topological action is local, right? Um, now, whether the Hamiltonian in this theta direction is local or not, uh, it need not be local. In Landau Fermi liquid theory, it's not local necessarily, okay? Um, uh, but the topological, the, uh, what we call the kinematic aspects, they are local in this theta direction, okay? And second, if, so as I said, this uh, interpretation in terms of phase space is not uh, really essential, but uh, um, uh, if you do make this interpretation, then the, uh, yeah, the two momentum and two space directions do not commute. But if you're looking at very long distance, the, you know, looking at the long distance uh, action, right? So this non-commutativity does not matter for, for these long distance variations. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So if you evaluate this 5D churn Simmons term for this configuration, then for the remaining three components, it reduces to a 3D churn Simmons action. And, uh, this, and, 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 and if you then evaluate it at the boundary theory, uh, uh, which is the, uh, the theory at the Fermi surface, then the n theta's, which commuted in the absence of the external two pi flux. Now they stop commuting and uh, their algebra, their commutation algebra is given by the familiar uh, uh, Cox-Moody algebra of a chiral 1D fermion. So this ties in very nicely with the expectation that in a magnetic field, that the quasi-particle moves chirally around the Fermi surface. Okay. Uh, okay. So it's interesting to, give an interpretation for this result in the following terms. When we turn on this two pi flux for the electromagnetic field, this 5D churn Simons term reduces to a 3D churn Simons term to remain three components. So interpreting the remaining three components as time and the two momentum directions, we see that what this 3D churn Simons term describes is an integer quantum Hall effect in momentum space in the interior of the Fermi surface, right? So the Fermi surface, is, a, is the boundary of the Fermi C, and the Fermi C has some, an integer quantum Hall state and momentum space, then right at the Fermi surface, we expect to find a chiral fermion. And of course, that's what we know from standard semi-classical physics, that there's a chiral fermion in the magnetic field at the Fermi surface, okay? A really nice observation is that Leringer's theorem follows directly from this anomaly. So in the UV theory, when we turn on a two pi flux, discrete unit translations will no longer commute. 
a simple way, a heuristic way to understand this is to uh, imagine moving two pi flux around the plaquette this way, right? And uh, if there's an average charge of mu per site, then uh, moving the two pi flux around the circuit will lead to an Arno Bohm phase of two pi times mu. So that's basically this equation. And we want to calculate the same thing using the embedding of these translations in the IR theory. So in the IR theory, translations are given by this. And in the presence of two pi flux, we know this commutation algebra. So then we can calculate this commutator and equating these two things directly gives us Leringer's theorem. Okay, so that's the anomaly point of view on Leringer's theorem. Now it turns out that apart from Leringer's theorem, uh, several of the universal properties of a Fermi liquid follow just from knowing its emergent symmetry and its anomaly. I already mentioned the response to electric fields, uh, quantum oscillations, and so on and so forth. So these properties which we call the kinematic properties must be distinguished from dynamical properties, which can also be universal and that require knowledge of the details of the IR Hamiltonian, for instance, the Fermi velocity or something. Okay. All right. So that's about Fermi liquids. So now let's move on to uh, more general compressible phases. So the main, one of the main results here is a theorem that, uh, for any irrational filling nu in d bigger than one, with GUB being u1 times lattice translations, the emergent internal symmetry GIR cannot be any compact Lie group. It has to be much, a much bigger symmetry than a compact Lie group. So there's various ways of understanding this theorem. Uh, I've sketched here uh, a simple way of thinking about it in two dimensions, but there's also uh, 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 you know, completely serious proofs uh, that my wonderful collaborators uh, uh, managed to prove. Uh, 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 I, since I'm running short of time, I won't uh, describe the argument, but to, so there is this theorem uh, that it gives you a very general constraint on compressible phases. So Fermi liquid satisfies this as the LU1 symmetry group is infinite dimensional, okay? Uh, but if you just postulate something else, uh, any other compressible state had better satisfy uh, this feature that GAR must be bigger than a compact Lie group, okay? So what can we expect once we go beyond Fermi liquids? So what the, the, the important question from this point of view to ask is what is the emergent internal symmetry of a non-Fermi liquid metal with, uh, 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 with this GU1? of a compressible known for liquid metal. So there's two distinct possibilities that this theorem allows. The first is that the emergent symmetry is still an infinite dimensional emergent symmetry, maybe the, even exactly the same as a Fermi liquid or perhaps some small variant thereof. So this is what we call an Ersatz Fermi liquids. And there's many examples uh, of Ersatz Fermi liquids that uh, uh, already exist in many constructions, for instance, the uh, standard theory of a Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson uh, would be an example of an Ersatz Fermi liquid. And there's many, many others as well. So this will include a huge class of non-Fermi liquid metals that will be consistent with the theorem. A, a distinct possibility is that the emergent symmetry group is finite dimensional, but non-compact. Now, we do not know whether there's actually a legal possibility for an internal symmetry in any state of matter, in any theory. Uh, there's uh, some seemingly good arguments to suspect that it may not be, but we don't really know. So for that reason, I'm just gonna ignore this possibility and talk about this as such from a liquid, okay? So, uh, so in a search from a liquid, even if the IR, GIR symmetry and the anomaly or the same as in the ordinary Fermi liquid, the detailed dynamical properties can be very different. It's only the kinematic properties that will be the same. But in particular, this infinite dimensional continuous symmetry means that there's an infinite number of emergent conserved quantities. And that in turn has extremely strong implications for thinking about transport and other dynamical properties than such non-Fermi liquid metals, okay? 
So let me just say a few things and then I'll finish. Uh, that, uh, uh, I, I can't see the time. Is, how am I doing on time? Uh, minus two minutes. Oh, minus two minutes. Uh, yeah, can I speak for maybe three or four minutes more or so yes. just, you want me to just stop? Yeah, I think that you can, you can go ahead. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll try to keep this quick. Uh, uh, so, so far, I've only talked about the consequences or assumptions one and three, that there's no disorder and that it's compressible. So now let's combine it with this assumption of conductivity scaling and ask what happens, okay? Uh, so there's an assumption two, that there's omega over T scaling in the conductivity, uh, means can be shown to mean that stain metal transport must be an intrinsic property of the fixed point theory. So there's an immediate tension with the existence of an infinite number of emergent conserved quantities that's basically implied by assumptions one and three, uh, because mixing of current with the conserved quantity will lead to an infinite conductivity. So this statement is probably familiar to many people from uh, situation from uh, systems where the IR theory conserves momentum. Um, because I'm out of time, maybe I'll very, only very briefly describe this. Uh, so if you take an IR theory with conserved momentum density P, then um, uh, let me just skip the details of the slide and just go to the final answer. Uh, then it, it's known that the real part of the conductivity has a delta function piece that comes from the mixing of current with momentum. So this numerator, which involves a susceptibility that tells you how much the current mixes with the momentum. Uh, and there's a denominator that involves the susceptibility of the momentum density itself. Now in a, in a simple theory, uh, chi JP will just be the charge density and chi PP will be the mass density. So the weight of the delta function is charge density, you know, is charge density squared by mass density. Okay, which is the familiar result. Uh, so in clean formula liquids, the low temperature conductivity is dominated by the broadening of the delta function by momentum dissipation coming from irrelevant operators, okay? So it's not an intrinsic property of the theory, right? It needs these irrelevant operators. Now in more general examples, uh, uh, this current J will overlap with all conserved operators of the IR theory with the same symmetry as the current under GUB, and this will typically lead to a delta function contribution to the conductivity, even at non-zero temperature, and that will have to be uh, uh, broadened by irrelevant perturbations. But then the tra transport will not be intrinsic. So it seems like there's a paradox, a seeming paradox. There's two contradictory claims. The first is that stain metal transport is intrinsic, which came from the omega over T scaling. And the second is that the stain metal uh, has an emergent symmetry, which uh, is associated with an infinite number of conserved quantities. And in, the, in a search for me liquid, it turns out that the overlap of current with these conserved quantities is guaranteed by the anomaly. So how do we resolve this tension, right? So the solution, the only way out, as far as we can tell, is that the susceptibilities of all the conserved quantities that overlap with the current must diverge, right? So I just argued that the numerator in this delta function must be non-zero. So the only option then is that the denominator goes to infinity, okay? So the denominator goes to infinity, we get rid of the delta function and then can get intrinsic conductivity. So what operators will overlap with the current uh, in the IR theory, right? So the operators that overlap must have the same symmetries as the current under GUV. So such operators must be ordered under time reversal and inversion they must have zero crystal momentum and they must transform as a vector under lattice rotations, right? So these symmetries are in fact the exact same symmetries as the famous loop current order uh, uh, proposed by Chandra Verma uh, for the last 20 something years. Uh, so loop currents have a very complicated uh, history in the cuprate literature. They've been advocated by Verma uh, for a long time and amazingly enough, there are many, many reports of static loop current order in the pseudo-gap regime. 
and it's equal equal number of controversies, equal number of papers that contradict that refute these reports. So there's a lot of confusion on what the experimental situation actually is. And it's theoretically, it's never been clear, uh, at least to me and maybe to many others. Uh, maybe it's been clear, the opposite has been clear to Chandra, but it's never been clear to me how it helps understand the basic phenomenon of the pseudo gap. Okay. So what we see is that we now have a completely different rationale for critically fluctuating order with the same symmetries as this loop current order in the strange metal. Right. So, uh, so maybe it's there actually, uh, but for reasons which perhaps could be different from uh, what Chandra was thinking about. So let me just finish here. There's a couple of other experimental tests of these ideas, but let me skip those and we just put up the summary set. Sorry, I went over by a few minutes. Yes. Yeah, thanks, uh, Santo, for the very great uh, talk. Uh, uh, although we uh, run out of time, but uh, I believe there are many questions. If everyone doesn't mind, let's take five, five more minutes to ask questions. Okay, so, so beer. Hi, Sindel. Uh, the picture you showed of the loop current order has a mirror plane uh, with, along the diagonal. Um, so, but there are other uh, orders which don't have any mirror planes, like the chiral spin liquid. Isn't that also a possibility? Um, See, this one is in fact not odd under reflection along the diagonal. Uh, and really you shouldn't say inversion, you should say mirror. Yeah, I, uh, I should say reflection, right? Yeah, yeah mirror, mirror planes or reflection, it's not inversion. Uh, so this one is even under a mirror plane along the diagonal. So. As a along consequence, this diagonal, right? no. along this no, diagonal, the other one. no, the other diagonal. Along this guy, it's odd, right? If I reflect about this plus goes to minus. No, no. If you just look at it, uh, the arrows are pointing in the same direction. It's it has a mirror plane symmetry, which is why it's sigma x y is zero. But there's other patterns which are consistent with David Shea's recent experiment and that he talked about last week. Uh, which no. are which don't have these mirror plane symmetry, and that's simply an orbital ferromagnet, which is the same symmetry as a chiral spin liquid. I think that's uh -huh. more compatible with what the kind of thing you're talking about. I have to run because I'm teaching in a few minutes. But okay. <laughs> well, I, 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 let, let, let me think that too. I'm aware of David Chase. Uh, yeah. I mean, no. The, this. You the, need, I, I might have pulled out the wrong picture. That's. Uh, you need all mirror planes to break, and this Varma's patterns do not break certain mirror planes, and that's why they're not exactly what you require. The mirror plane along um, the direction of the current that should be preserved, right? It's only the other mirror plane that needs to be broken. No, but the current can flow in many different directions, so you you can't. Yeah, so so it's a vector order parameter, right? Right, so but this would mean that your mechanism wouldn't apply for currents in certain directions. Is that right? Um, okay, I have to run to teach a class. Sorry. <laughs> well, thanks to be thanks for that comment. Okay, uh, Tenko, please. All right. So, so, so all these are uh, uh, big conservation. Uh, that, so, does it give any constraint on the uh, uh, coefficient of the linear T transport? Like uh, well, I mean the Planckian uh, Planckian metal has like order one uh, with uh, with the T with temperature. Uh, I mean the scattering rate is order one with temperature. So, yeah, uh, so constraint. In, in, in this story, you know, we've not said anything about Planckian or anything, right? But but we do assume that the conductivity satisfies omega over T scaling. So if you wish. You know, there's always a question of how do you define the scattering rate in a non fermi liquid? You know, that's a, a weak coupling concept. So if you define the scattering rate as simply saying that the uh, that it's the uh, it's it's a frequency scale associated with some structure in sigma of omega, then omega over t scaling, the assumption of omega over t scaling assumes that the frequency scale is kBT over h bar. Okay, so the entire statement, but maybe it went through by quickly, the entire statement is that 
this guy is killed. So the contribution of the conserved quantities to the transport is killed by the assumption of a diverging susceptibility. And everything comes from this incoherent transport. Uh huh. Okay. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, send me, please. Yeah, I have, I think, maybe a much more naive question than many of the of the fancy condensed matter theorists. So I'm just a field theorist. So I well, imagine coupling a uh, couple of Fermi surface to anything, you know, Fermi surface coupled to X, and ask what happens along the RG flow. And to my naive intuition, the infinite number of conserved quantities that led to your loop of U1 get broken by the momentum transfer events that occur due to the interaction of the Fermi surface with X. Now, how should I think about this kind of system as fitting into your general framework? Do you think most of them violate it because the symmetries aren't preserved along the flow and so your spontaneous breaking is violated? Or do you think uh, your, your theorem does apply to all such systems in which case, no matter what you couple a Fermi surface to, if you get a gapless state in the infrared, it has an infinite number of conserved quantities that deform the conserved momenta at the surface? Or how should I think of this? Right, so, so then, you know, it, 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 to take an example that you're very familiar with, you know, Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson at zero momentum, right? Uh, so then the, you can ask about the IR theory, right? And uh, so there is a, there's a set of uh, the UV fixed point that you're thinking about, which is the Fermi surface with zero coupling to these critical bosons, right? So there's an, there's an infinite set of symmetries associated with the conservation of the bare quasi-particles at each point of the Fermi surface. And then the, the IR theory, the claim is that the IR theory of these uh, systems also has an, an infinite number of conserved quantities at each point of the Fermi surface. But you agree that along the flow, it seems like they're manifest to be broken. The, the flow is complicated, right? So well, I'm not analyzing the OG flow the itself. I agree it's complicated, but you know you can do perturbation theory about the UV fixed point and see the symmetries break. Sure, yeah, there's momentum transfer. So the objects that were conserved in the UV theory, they're not the same objects that are conserved in the IR theory. So those objects have changed. So <laughs> it's a coincidence that the same symmetry reemerges in the IR that was broken along the flow from the UV. It, it, it depends on the details of the flow, right? So there may be a path that you can find where you maintain, where you deform the conserved operators without deforming the symmetry itself. Well, I guess that's what I'm asking because you're using anomaly matching. And if you can't do that, you can't use anomaly matching. I'm actually not using anomaly matching in the sense that it's, that it's used in field theory. Okay, well, I'll bother you more later. Sorry? I will bother you more later, thank you. Yeah, no, so, so, and then this story, the you know, uh, if you accept, and I know that Shamit at least at some point of his life didn't quite accept this, but if you accept the standard patch theory that uh, many, many people, even in this uh, 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 Zoom meeting, uh, have worked on, then the standard patch theory um, uh, does have separate conservation of uh, quasi particles in each patch of the Fermi surface, right? So if you accept the patch theory, then you certainly have infinite uh, number of conserved quantities. In the and fixed you, think that that you think that's true even in perturbation theory about the UV fixed point? I don't know. Okay. I have a variant of this question. Mm -hmm. Is it clear what the lowest dimension operator that violates this symmetry is in the IR? In other words, usually when we have an enhanced symmetry, an emergent symmetry, it's important to understand what is the lowest dimension operator that violates it that would give us a sense of how accurate the symmetry is in the IR. Yeah, so that requires an actual model, right? So here we don't have, we're trying to do things at a very general level. So we can't calculate any of those scaling dimensions, any of those dimensions. But in the absence of a model, it's impossible to make any statement of, about that. Yeah, but even in an example, even if it's not the real model, what, what, what kind of operator can do the job? 
Yeah, so so I could write down, for instance, in this Fermi surface coupled to a critical boson. Um, yeah, I could write down a, an operator in the UV theory that involves uh, uh, a, a four, uh, some four fermion operator that conserves lattice momentum but breaks the all the emergent momentum conservation. Right? Uh, what in current spider physics would be called an Umklaff scattering event. So I could add that term in the UV theory, and it will have some faith in the IO theory, but uh, yeah, um, uh, I need enough knowledge of the IO theory to be able to tell you. Uh, okay, uh, so in Fermi liquid theory, where we understand everything, we know what the leading such operator is. And that's precisely what's called in club scattering. And it uh, uh, leads to effects where it gives a lifetime for the quasi particle that goes like one over temperature squared and so on and so forth. Okay, I think Max, Max had a question. Yeah. Uh, so first, first uh, maybe a comment. Uh, I think in thermal liquid theory, the leading operator is the PCS operator, right? Which is marginally irrelevant. That breaks. Uh, yeah, no, that's true. Uh, I've, I've been throwing out BCS completely. Yeah, thank you. Uh, but then two questions. Uh, so first one, is it enough to have uh, just one uh, operator with this divergent susceptibility to... Uh... Yeah, uh, so long as all, all other operators with the same symmetry, you know, generically you would expect that they all will overlap with this, uh, you know, um, um, sorry, are you asking about the IR theory or the UV theory? Uh, I'm asking about the IR theory. Yeah, so in the IR theory, you need all operators, or you know, of, of these con infinite number of conserved quantities, you need the uh, uh, the susceptibility for uh, yeah for all operators that overlap with the current. Uh, you know, their susceptibility must diverge. For all of them. Yeah, so it's, a, you know, so really there's a matrix involved, right? So the current can overlap with, uh, so, so the weight, the weight that goes into this delta function will be, uh, there'll be matrices involved there. Mm -hmm. right? And yeah, you just have to make sure that that matrix has, uh, uh, you know, that, that matrix is such that that coefficient goes to zero. I see. And I also had a second question related to that. So presumably, you know, you, you only have divergence at zero temperature. At finite temperature, it's yeah. probably cut off. So, right. yeah. but... Uh... Right, so, so what happens is, uh, what will happen is that at finite temperature, uh, two things happen, right? First, you will reactivate this uh, bottleneck effect, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, because delta function will no longer be, its coefficient will no longer be zero. But then you won't have a strict delta function because these emergent conserved quantities, their conservation will be destroyed by irrelevant operators, right? But then those, those two effects seem quite, quite different. One is maybe, already uh, capturable in the uh, theory with no irrelevant operators. That is the, That's you know, a, that yeah. chi becomes finite. And uh, so it seems like they would have different strengths somehow. That they will have different strengths. Now you can ask about the total weight associated with, uh, so clearly the weight of the delta function is becoming small at low temperature, right? So even when this, so, so there's two things. There's a weight of the delta function, which is non-zero, but small at non-zero temperature. And also there's a broadening of the delta function coming from the irrelevant perturbations, which, so these are two different effects, right? The net result will be a contribution to the conductivity, uh, uh, which is non-zero, uh, but the weight of that contribution, the total uh, strength in the, in the integral of the frequency of that contribution, Will become will be very small at low temperature, right? Mm -hmm. 
So in principle, if there's big disorder or something, you know, that can just give you a tiny correction to the diverging contribution to sigma coming from the incoherent piece. Okay, uh, due to the time limit, we, we will have the last uh, two questions. I think uh, Damson can go first and then Taran. Um, hi, 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 Sinjo. Uh, I have a question about the divergence of the susceptibility. Um, how, um, how, how general you expect it to be? So for example, it would um, exclude any um, theory with a boost invariant, Galilean or Lorentz invariant. Yeah, yeah, the, the Galilean invariants, the weight of the delta function is fixed to be, you know, N, N over M, where M is the bare mass of the fermions. Right. But of course, yeah. the kinds of systems we're interested in, they're so far away from Galilean invariants that we don't so, care about anybody. So if I take a Galilean invariant fermion and couple that to bosons, it seems that the the whole thing is still Galilean variant. So, where? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, 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 yeah. So there, you won't get the. Uh, you will get a delta function piece. You're guaranteed that by Galilean invariance. Right? So the statement here is not that every theory of a Fermi surface, every non-Fermi liquid will uh, only have the incoherent piece. Right. Mm -hmm. That's. You know, we're asking what does it take to get the kind of things that are seen the, to, to be consistent with the assumptions that we made about uh, say the cuprate strain metal, right? So the subclass of non forming liquids that are capable of uh, giving you what's seen is things for which uh, this uh, susceptibility has diverged so that this piece is killed. Yeah, my confusion is that um, usually we think about fermion cu coupled to bosons in such a way that it doesn't matter whether there is a um, boost invariance or not, which is important that there is a linear dispersion in the beginning um, around the Fermi surface. So you say that there is something something else that- um, Yeah, so, so Galilean yeah. invariance imposed this. And we know this even in ordinary Fermi liquid theory, right? So in ordinary Fermi liquid theory, there's an M star and there's an F1 and if you just work in the approximation where you just linearize the dispersion near the Fermi surface, you would not imagine that there's any relationship between M star and F1. But if you knew that the theory came from a Galilean invariant theory, these are tied together and they're related to the bare mass. Right? So Galilean invariants impose extra constraints on the low energy theory that you would not guess, that you would not have if you didn't have Galilean, you know, uh, yeah, it just imposes extra constraints. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Tara, go, go ahead. Uh, hi, Senator. I just a uh, remedial question. Uh, uh, you uh, you showed that in in two plus one d, the chiral mode in the presence of magnetic field can be thought as a quantum hall in the in the momentum space. Um, and if I go to three plus one d, uh, what happens and is there something like a topological insulator at the boundaries? I mean, it's like a boundary of. Uh, is there something interesting there also, or is it is it like a layered quantum hall, or what is the? Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually tried to think about it from to give it an interpretation in terms of this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't know. Perhaps Dominic has some. Uh, it's Dominic. I see. He may be here. Maybe. I mean, it, it can be like a, a 4D quantum hole. I mean, it depends what background fields you apply. I think there's some configuration of background fields that maybe becomes a quantum hole state still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. And then you have to think about these, I guess, the loop space is also slightly different. I mean, it's S. It's like S2 to S2. I mean, it's, I mean, it's something like that. I, I mean, it's, it's still a U1 phase factor. Uh, oh, so sorry. No, I, I mean, uh, there are, there are two U1s, right? In the sense that theta and phi maybe. So these are called, I don't, doesn't matter. But I mean, the, the Fermi surface is two dimensional, right? So, so it's not, 
It's maps. So it's maps. To U1. Oh. Face is U1, of course. Uh, I understand. Um, maybe you can repeat once more. Sorry, what you're saying? Well, it's maps from S2 to U1. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, but uh, yeah. Okay. No, that, that, that's correct. But uh, the fact that it's S2 to U1 has any different, I mean, is there any qualitative difference from S1 to S1 or is it all, I don't know, maybe it's, doesn't matter. Um, anyway, it doesn't, yeah, I, I, I haven't talked to this question. That's fine. I, I need to think more. Yeah, this is story. This is similar. Yeah, okay. The, the okay. pictures, in, in terms of interpretation, the pictures are, uh, 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 this I myself haven't tried to think about the uh, pictures. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking whether the topological terms you're writing look slightly different or. But, um, yeah, it, it, it'll always be something in phase space, right? So it's right. Uh, no, you know, seven dimensional, uh, mm -hmm. seven dimensional chunks and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two n plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that was all. I I don't have anything more. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Let, let's thank Santa again for the great talk. Um, thank you. Let me stop.